first of all, thank you for inviting me. It's my pleasure to work with such a talented group of people. It's it's always fun uh, working with all of you, getting these cases, which uh, you know can be really interesting. And you know, the more I do these, the more I realize, you know, from the patient's perspective, how helpful the service this is. Certainly speaking to the Canadian contingent, having relatives in Canada, I know somehow I know how sometimes they feel kind of trapped in the in the system where. You know, it's not that the doctors aren't good or the system isn't good. It's just that it's it's a different system in terms of access. Things are not as easily obtained as we'd like them to be. And so I think having this outlet, such as Best Doctors, where you can collate your material, send it to somebody in another country even, and, and then get an answer back within days, I think is marvelous. And I, I go around raving to everybody how, how great a service it is, and certainly in the U.S. as well. So so I, I feel that I learn a lot from each of these cases because it teaches me what – you know what's going on in, in in other parts of the world, how people are managing things, and and also teaches me how to to you know make diagnoses kind of you know over over the internet, which I think is the wave of the future. I mean, if you look at how uh, things are shaping up, you know, probably in five or ten years from now, they're predicting there'll be you know apps that will help you self-diagnose. Although, I think when it comes to pain syndromes, we're we're, we're never going to have that capability. I think it's still going to be down to uh, sort of this general approach of aches and pains. So I'm going to start my slide talk. First, I'm going to thank Sarah Tedeschi, one of our fellows who actually created a lot of these slides, including the, she's responsible for the Dr. Seuss motif here, so so I take no credit for that. So uh, can these slide, slides be moved or can I move it? Okay, there there we go. So So basically we have, that's okay. So we have a bunch of take-home points here that I'm just going to summarize here. And uh, we'll go through these uh, over the next few minutes, including distinguishing arthritis from arthralgias, which I think is really important when you're reviewing these cases, and uh, especially when it comes to the patients with chronic pain who initially are told they have rheumatoid arthritis or lupus or something, and, and what you're really hearing are joint arthralgias, meaning they have joint pain, but they don't have swelling or inflammation. And then we'll hear about the no pads, you know, that's just this mnemonic we'll go over and talk about how demographics may help in examining more than joints and images and so forth. So let's just go on to the next slide. So arthritis is really, as I mentioned, a combination of, uh, you know, joint inflammation changes. So you want to see swelling, you want to see objective evidence that somebody could look at you and say, aha, uh -huh, this is swollen, this is inflamed, this is red, this is hot, as opposed to arthralgia, which is more like what happens when you get the flu. You ache, you hurt, but we can't see anything. I have to take your word that you're hurting. And this, again, applies to patients with chronic pain where it's purely subjective. You don't know if the patient is really telling you the truth, or if they are telling you the truth, you can't really quantify their pain levels just by looking at the joint. On the other hand, in a rheumatoid patient or somebody with you know active inflammation, you could see if they have a really boggy, swollen joint, or if it's minimally swollen or massively swollen. And then the differential diagnosis of joint pain in general, and, and this is just a short list here, but let's just go through some of these. So, so bursitis and tendonitis are, you know, uh, pains that uh, can sometimes come on with, you know, localized soft tissue disturbances around uh, a joint. So, for example, a common bursa would be the trochanteric bursa around the hip or the anserine bursa around the knee or there are several bursae around the shoulder areas. Uh, tendonitis and bursitis are really synonymous terms. And, and again, uh, the tip-off there is that, you, you, unlike arthritis, usually you can, you know, palpate these areas and they're point tender. They're usually not over joint areas. Uh, that, they're over a joint area, but they usually are associated with pain, usually because you're laying on that side, like a trochanteric bursitis uh, or a shoulder bursitis. You lay on that shoulder at night, you get the pain. Whereas with arthritis, laying on it isn't usually going to make a difference. Overuse syndromes, uh, certainly we see a lot of those, you know, the patients who come in with painful arms. And, you know, I remember doing a couple of cases from the Netherlands where it seems to be quite rampant. And, you know, it's really hard to know what overuse really is. I mean, is it really overuse or is it some kind of pain syndrome? Uh, if the patient stops using their hands, for example, they don't always improve, so, so that's a bit of a challenge. Neuropathy is something to consider. It's certainly the burning, numbness, tingling symptoms that people have in the distal extremities can be confused for arthritis, but usually it's obvious based on the, the description of pins and needles and tingling and so forth. Now, metastatic cancer comes up a lot, but I have to say, even in my experience as a rheumatologist, I, I can't think of 
any case that I've ever really seen of a patient who presented with joint achiness, it turns out to be cancer. So even though people list it in the differential, I think it's vastly overstated. And, you know, it, for an exam purpose, it would be correct. But in reality, I don't think it really should be on the top five or ten things. But I just listed there to bring that up. Then the vasculitides, such as cryoglobulinemia, for example, due to hepatitis, hepatitis C in particular, can cause intense arthralgias. And in fact, patients who have vasculitis usually don't have a severe arthritis. They just have a lot of joint achiness. But that, again, just proves that some of the rheumatologic or systemic diseases aren't all based on having markedly swollen joints. You can have arthralgias and still have something serious going on. Thyroid disease, hyper and hypo, can certainly cause joint achiness. It's something to, to consider, and uh, you know we always look to see what their thyroid function is. And then finally, a few others, bone diseases. Uh, metabolic bone diseases can cause joint achiness. Severe vitamin D deficiency can cause uh, bone achiness. You'd have to be pretty low, but that could certainly happen. Localized uh, joint pain can be due to a stress fracture that's missed or avascular necrosis that's uh, missed as well. And then finally, the big two uh, that comes up a lot in these pain cases are fibromyalgia and depression. So fibromyalgia, uh, as you know, is widespread pain, you know, chronic pain syndrome of some sort, if you want to call it that. What's different in fibromyalgia, if you look at the old criteria, it used to be that you had 19 trigger points on your body, and if you had more than 11, you counted. And these trigger points were around the neck, the low back, around the arms, around the knees, and so forth. And people would go around palpating these. And sometimes I'd see these really, I, I, what I would call silly notes by other rheumatologists, where they'd say, oh, the patient doesn't have fibromyalgia because they only have eight trigger points out of 19, and they don't have the 11. That's all changed now. The new criteria really is, is more reflective of the fact that patients can have widespread pain. So if you have unexplained pain in one or two extremities or over a chest wall or back, it's really more of a region than you think of fibromyalgia. So it doesn't have to be trigger point tenderness anymore because a lot of our patients don't have trigger point tenderness. They just ache all over in a very nonspecific way. And fibromyalgia and depression really go hand in hand, unfortunately. Some people will argue, well, if you're always in pain, wouldn't you be depressed or vice versa? And it's interesting that with functional MRI, it's been discovered that a lot of these trigger point areas or now pain perception areas are also areas that light up on functional MRI in patients who have depression. And it kind of makes sense if you think about it. You know, d depressed people don't feel good physically, and, and patients who have physical pain often get depressed by the pain. So, so the two can be linked probably on a genetic or biological basis, but also, you know, that's how we're hardwired in our brain. So, so that doesn't surprise me. But pure depression per se shouldn't give you fibromyalgia. You know, there are a lot of people who are depressed who have no body pains, but the two certainly go together. What's always been striking to me in a way is if you look at all these records that we get, you know, patients with fibromyalgia are rarely, if ever, managed by the people who probably should be managing this, which are psychiatrists. And, and they kind of just have learned to keep away from this disorder. But in truth, they are the ones who I think could help us most because, as you know, many of the drugs that we use for fibromyalgia include the SSRI drugs, and, and that's really more of the domain of the psychiatrist than anybody else. Okay, let's go on to the next slide. So the arthritis-focused history, I think this is important just to keep in mind that what really helps is if they, you know, what, how many joints does a patient have? Is it monoarticular, oligoarticular, or polyarticular? And you can see the definitions. Monoarthritis is really just the one joint. And whenever we see one joint, the main thing we want to rule out is infection. So infection isn't always the cause of a monoarthritis, but that's the key that you don't want to miss because that could be... Uh, in an extreme case, it could be fatal, but it could certainly cause morbidity if you miss a, a septic joint. So monoarthritis is sepsis till proven otherwise, but also crystal arthritis such as gout and pseudogout. We'll come back to that. Oligoarthritis, it's, which is usually just, you know, two, three, maybe up to four joints, usually scattered distribution, oligoarticular, asymmetric pattern. Uh, that's more often seen with a spondyloarthritis. So the term spondyloarthritis refers to the diseases that are HLA-B27 related, so that would be psoriatic disease, uh, inflammatory bowel disease associated arthritis, reactive arthritis, what we used to call Reiter's syndrome, and ankylosing spondylitis. 
And the polyarticular diseases would be more in keeping with, say, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, and the connective tissue diseases, which usually have more uh, than five. So, so that's a rough distinction here. The onset, you know, again, somebody with acute onset, you think of a septic arthritis, but crystals can also come on very acutely, such as an attack of gout. And sometimes a monoarthritis is not really an arthritis, but it's more a trauma to that joint. So, you know, that's obviously available in the history. The pattern, you know, I would probably even delete the, the letter P from this. People, you know, used to pay a lot of attention, whether it was additive, meaning, you know, joints got added on over time, or migratory, meaning, you know, jumped around from place to place or intermittent. Uh, I'm not sure how helpful that is. So instead of calling this no pads, I would call it no ads and remove the P because I don't think that the pattern really helps me all that much. You know, I have some patients with rheumatoid arthritis where at the beginning it's intermittent or it becomes migratory or it becomes additive. So it doesn't really help me. The activity effect can be helpful. Usually patients who have tendonitis uh, or inflammatory conditions will feel worse when they get up in the morning. So the first, a very important time of day is how do you feel first thing in the morning? So think about it yourself. If you have sort of an overuse syndrome, if you were working out too much at the gym, you might feel stiff in the morning the following day, but you get up, you get over it within a few minutes. But patients with inflammatory arthritis tend to be stiff, usually globally stiff, for lengthy periods of time, you know, inordinate amounts of time. So a young patient may describe 20 to 40 minutes of morning stiffness, needing a hot shower to get going, and that's day after day after day. It's not just one day. So it, it, you know that that's not normal. And there's no definition for how much is acceptable morning stiffness. But I think the older you get, you're probably allowed a couple of minutes of stiffness, but that's about it, a couple of minutes. And what I often ask patients is, has this changed? Have you always been like this? So if a 70-year-old patient tells me, I've always had 20 minutes of stiffness, that hasn't changed, fine. But if now there are 40 minutes of stiffness, that's different. Or in a 30-year-old, if they say, gee, I can't get up in the morning, it's takes me hard to get, get out of bed and shower and so forth, that confirms to me that this is probably going to be inflammatory. And then we'll see the distribution, you know, if it's upper or lower extremity, we'll come back to that in a minute. And also we look at systemic or extra articular symptoms, which can also be helpful. So let's go on to the next slide. So you can see here this, yeah, that's fine. So what, what we're going to talk about, the acute monoarticular diseases would be, uh, as you see, crystal arthritis, gout, pseudogout, calcium pyrophosphate. Calcium pyrophosphate you don't see very often, but these are patients who have like calcific tendonitis with a chunk of calcium uh, near a joint. The other non-inflammatory conditions that, that can look like crystal, as we talked about, are avascular necrosis, which would be picked up on imaging studies. Fracture, again, on imaging, and a bloody, you know, joint team arthrosis, which, again, would be due to trauma. Then on the inflammatory side, we have bacteria, fungi, Lyme, mycobacteria, viruses, etc. And the infection etiology, I'd say, for the most part, you know, the one that comes on acutely would be bacteria. And when you can't, you know, make the diagnosis easily and you still suspect infection, that's when fungus, mycobacteria, virus all come into play. And then finally, we have Lyme disease. And we'll talk a little bit more about Lyme because that's kind of a unique uh, presentation. And then we have systemic diseases that sometimes present with one joint. So again, as I, as I said, these things can change over time. So even rheumatoid arthritis can sometimes present with one, uh, but psoriatic and B27 conditions such as reactive arthritis uh, usually present with one or two or three joints. And then on your right side, as I showed you, these are some of the non-inflammatory conditions. Again, malignancy comes up, but I would downplay it because it's pretty rare for patients to have a malignancy as their presentation. Now, having said that, I once did a CPC in New England Journal exactly on that topic, but that's how rare it is that patients, you know, who have a malignancy presenting as joint inflammation, you know, it usually gets written up as a case report or as a, you know, unique case for discussion. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so let's go to the distribution of involved joints. So uh, just press on that again, and it'll show you. This is osteoarthritis. So this shows you what the common joints are involved. So you can see the spine is involved in osteoarthritis, commonly in the neck and the lower back. The thoracic spine is spared in most of these conditions. And then you've got the hip, and you've got the knee, and you've got this, the, carpal, the CMC, or carpometacarpal joint in the hand, the base of your thumb, the PIP joints, the DIP joints. Notice that the MCP joints are typically not involved, and the shoulder's not involved. For the shoulder to be involved by osteoarthritis, you probably need a history of rotator cuff tear so that you've got an unstable joint. Otherwise, you don't get OA in the shoulder. 
You don't get OA in the elbow. You don't get OA in the wrist. Uh, they only happen if you had trauma to that joint. So again, if I see somebody who's labeled as osteoarthritis, but their involvement is the wrist and the elbows, I know that that's going to be wrong. Uh, the hip, the knee, typical joints, the ankle, sometimes you see it again, usually with trauma. And in the foot, you can certainly get it in the big toe uh, more than anywhere else. Uh, next slide. Or just press down. Okay. And you could uh, – uh, let's go back to that because I just want – okay. So that's rheumatoid arthritis. And you can see the difference between OA and RA. RA, many more joints can be involved. And you can see there really – you know, is, is no exception in RA. I mean, the typical joints would be shoulders and elbows and wrists, but MCPs now are involved. PIPs are involved. PIPs can also be involved with OA. So it can get tricky if the PIP is the only joint involved in somebody. Is it, you know, going to turn out to be OA or RA? And that's where clinical skill and judgment help. Uh, the hips can be involved, but usually it's more OA. Knees, definitely. Ankles, feet, uh, and toes, et cetera. Good. Next slide, please. Now, look, let's look at psoriatic arthritis. So psoriatic arthritis is interesting because that can be all of the above. You can get spine involvement with the sacroiliac joints. You can get upper extremity involvement. But notice here the distal joints, the DIP joints, which are typical for OA, can also be involved in psoriatic disease, and that's kind of a unique feature for it. And look again, the distal joints of the toe can be involved. So, so this is a more interesting disease. It has some features that look a little like RA, and some patients can look just like RA and they happen to have a skin rash, but some of these patients can have this very unusual involvement. Next slide. Yeah, Next someone, slide. Someone has this on hold and I'm muting them. <laughs> okay. So if you look at uh, the next slide, this is comparing psoriatic to gout, for example. And gout would be uh, more typical in the lower extremities. So you could see that's why it's in red. Usually the big toe, podagra, would be commonest. But the knee and the ankle can certainly be involved. As your burden of gout gets worse, meaning as you uric, as you retain more uric acid, it can involve the upper extremity joints. So you can see the hand involvement can occur, elbow involvement, but shoulders, you know, not common, hips, certainly not common. So again, so if somebody has hip disease, for example, you know, you're not thinking of gout, you're not thinking of psoriatic disease, for example, based on, on these little uh, clinical definitions that I've shown you here. Okay, next slide, please. And then pseudogout versus gout. I think the main thing to, to consider here uh, would be that pseudogout typically involves the wrist much more than it does uh, in gout, for example. Not to say that you don't see gout involving the wrist, but if I saw an older woman with acute swollen, uh, uh, swelling in her wrist, I'd say it's pseudogout as opposed to gout. If I saw an older guy with an ankle that's swollen, I'd say it's more likely gout than pseudogout. But again, you can see there's a lot of overlap. And at the end of the day, to make a diagnosis of a crystal, you really need to look at the fluid under a polarizing microscope and to identify which crystal it is. Is it gout or is it pseudogout based on that? And in the acute, in the acute phase, it doesn't matter really because you would treat these identically or virtually identically with anti-inflammatories or even steroids or intraarticular injections. It matters long-term to know if it's gout or pseudogout because gout you can actually treat and prophylax with drugs like allopurinol, whereas with pseudogout, there really is uh, not much you can do in terms of prevention in most of these patients. Next slide. And then we look for systemic uh, features. So obviously, fever always raises the issue of uh, infection, certainly if it's over 100, 101. You know, some patients with lupus or rheumatoid arthritis can have fevers, but usually they're low grades. So 98, 90, you know, 99, 99, 5 is okay. If you're 101, 102, that is infection until proven otherwise. And then we look at things like a rash. So if somebody has a rash of psoriasis or if they have a malar rash, that's obviously a tip-off for lupus. If they have a very fine rash, it could be parvovirus or fifth disease in some women. And you can see all sorts of other rashes, for example, erythema chronica migraines, uh, which is typical for Lyme disease. Erythema nodosum is another one that you can see with patients who have uh, you know, a unique disease or they have sarcoid. And erythema marginatum can be seen in some of the connective tissue diseases. Next slide, please. So that's just showing you some of these different slides, uh, some of these different uh, rashes. But again, you know, when you're getting the protocol, these are things that, you know, have obviously been described or 
if they, if they were there, but sometimes it can obviously be missed as well. Other things to look for besides the rashes you can see here would be associated features. Is there ocular disease? Is there GI or GU disease? Why? Because a lot of these things can be seen in a reactive or spondyl arthritis. Uh, if you have Raynaud's, if you have oral ulcers, if you have uh, cirrhosal inflammation like pleuritis or pericarditis, we think of connective tissue diseases or we think of obscure diseases like Bechet's, which we sometimes uh, see as well. And then we look for other risk factors. So meaning if somebody has a history of hepatitis C, I always look to see, okay, do they have cryoglobulinemia? Because hep C makes your body, can make your body make these cryoproteins, which then get distributed and plug up different blood vessels in different parts of the body. Some people get drug-induced lupus, for example, when they uh, are on certain drugs, uh, especially the, some of the old antiarrhythmic drugs can do it, uh, but we don't see uh, much of that anymore. And then, some, uh, and then finally, you can get uh, diuretics, chronic diuretic use, or certain drugs like cyclosporin can predispose people to gout. And then I'm not going to talk much about hemochromatosis except to say that that's a, an interesting disease that can sometimes present with, with pseudogout. So whenever I see a new patient who has pseudogout, if they're especially young, and I define young very loosely now, but I'd say somebody over, uh, under the age of, say, 65 or 70 even, if they have a new onset of pseudogout, you know, I just want to make sure that they don't have a metabolic reason for it. So I might check their iron levels. I might check their PTH levels because that can sometimes be an occult presentation for those conditions, which would have to be treated separately as well. Okay, next slide, please. So who is the patient? So again, these might be helpful clues. If you have a young woman who has a monoarthritis you know, you might think of gonococcal arthritis, you might think of parvovirus or rubella or lupus when they have polyarthritis, but you're not going to see crystals in a young person. You're not going to see OA in somebody under the age of 30. A young male, uh, same sort of situation here, except ankylosing spondylitis would be a possibility. Reactive arthritis is another possibility. You know, in the right populations, HIV or uh, hepatitis C is also something to consider. And then as you get older, uh, you start to see RA becoming more predominant. So rheumatoid arthritis usually involves women around the, the uh, you know, pregnancy years. So that's not middle-aged, obviously, but you can start to see it around age 30 or so. But it usually peaks around age 40 or 50 for men and, and for women as well. And then as you get older, you know, osteoarthritis starts to rear its head. So a lot of people over the age of 60 will have pain in joints and, you know, very often there's associated osteoarthritis, so that might be the only diagnosis. And then you think of other conditions such as PMR, or polymyalgia rheumatica, which certainly affects people over the age of 50 with pain and stiffness and so forth. And then we just have a line here about different uh, racial uh, associations. So lupus can, can be more severe in black populations. Gout, it can be more severe in Asian populations. And uh, polymyalgia, hemochromatosis, for example, tend to run in uh, Northern European populations. Bechet's disease, the gene has been traced to the uh, silk route in the Middle East, so Iran, the Middle East, uh, North Africa, and interestingly, the Japanese population as well. And then finally, we have Lyme disease, which shows up a lot in the northeast of the U.S., uh, and also now spreading to other parts of the country, especially the, mid, the upper Midwest. And then rheumatic fever, although it's not an issue here, you can see it certainly in your South American patients and patients from Asia. Next slide, please. So again, uh, just to summarize here, if you have a symmetric polyarthritis, what are the things we're looking at? You know, parvo is certainly worth considering if you're thinking of viruses, parvovirus, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, HIV, Epstein-Barr, that's a bit tougher because everybody's been exposed to Epstein-Barr. And for a while, we used to think that that was the cause for rheumatoid arthritis. But I'd say hep the hepatitis serologies, HIV in the right population, rubella and parvo are the ones to consider. And sometimes, you know, if somebody works, say, with kids, kindergarten teacher, you know, parvovirus is worth checking for. If they don't have any direct exposure to kids, or especially kids who've been sick, then it becomes less of an issue. Post-infectious disease, again, as I mentioned, in the right, in the right countries, you might be thinking about post-streptococcal uh, infections, which is more of an autoimmune. It's not really an infection. It's more of an immune reaction to streptococcus causing a problem, like glomerulonephritis or polyarthritis, and the same for rheumatic fever. 
Rheumatoid arthritis uh, certainly is symmetric. Palindromic rheumatism, which is really a unusual form of RA in the earliest phases where these patients get an explosive type of arthritis, which comes and goes, comes and goes, and then over time declares itself as rheumatoid arthritis. And then you can see all these systemic rheumatic diseases, lupus, Sjogren's, and so forth, which is you know, a whole variety of these conditions, which again can be hard to uh, to diagnose without getting some additional labs and getting some additional history as well. And then we look down at the list and you can see polyarthritis can, you know, osteoarthritis can be polyarticular. You can have more than one joint. Crystal arthritis such as CPPD uh, can be polyarticular as well. So all these things are possible. Next slide, please. And then asymmetric so again, symmetry is important. Why is there symmetry? We don't know, but it happens. So asymmetric, you know, usually infection is going to be one joint. So I'm not so worried about an asymmetric uh, arthritis being infectious unless it's just the one joint. You know, it's unusual unless somebody's really, really sick that they're going to have an asymmetric oligoarthritis due to an infection, a bacterial infection. Now, other infections, you know, gonococcus, certainly it's been described. Lyme disease tends to be one joint as well. So it's pretty, pretty rare to have more than one joint. And then asymmetric, you know, I think more of the crystal conditions, the spondyloarthritis, and some of the rheumatic diseases that are that are showing up on that slide. Next slide, please. So the exam, you know, careful exam, uh, and, and unfortunately this doesn't happen a lot. So in a lot of the records that I review, you know, you'll see the rheumatology note, note will include a joint exam. But if you don't have a rheumatology note, chances are you don't have a real joint exam. Internists, unfortunately, just it's kind of like a wasteland. They don't examine the joints. This happens everywhere. You know, I, I complain when we do consults at my hospital, teaching hospital, and, and yet, you know, if a patient's admitted for polyarticular joint you know, uh, swelling and, and fevers and whatever, you're lucky if you can get somebody to even have described a knee exam. Uh, people will give vital signs, they'll listen to the heart, they'll listen to the lungs, they'll look at the skin, they might tap out a few reflexes, but the joints are, are usually avoided. So, so that is a problem. Uh, but then, obviously, looking for other things. If it's a systemic disease, you might find other clues. So we really Im implore patients, uh, implore physicians to do a full exam and to look at everything. Next slide. And labs and imaging. So labs, again, the most important thing I could say is if you have a swollen joint and you're not sure of the diagnosis, you've got to get the fluid out. You've got to analyze the fluid. Without that, you, you're losing a key, key element of, of uh, the workup. So we're always pushing for patients to have their joints tapped when it's appropriate. And then we do the labs, which I've shown you here. And the basic labs, the CBC, liver, hepatic function, urinalysis, important. Sed rate and CRP are really important for us. Why? Because, you know, they're very telling. So if your sed rate and CRP show some elevations, it usually points to something inflammatory. If they're rock steady normal, that's often helpful too. So for example, when you're seeing a patient with fibromyalgia who you think might have a chronic pain syndrome, invariably their sed rate and CRP are gonna be normal. If their sed rate and CRP are up, then I don't feel comfortable signing off as this patient just has a chronic pain syndrome. I still gotta figure out why are their markers still ri uh, rising or elevated. So, so that's a, a really important test. The antinuclear antibody, the ANA by itself, especially in a low titer, is meaningless. So meaning when you see those ANAs of 1 to 40, 1 to 80, 1 to 160, if there's nothing else going on, if their sed rate, their CRP is normal and they don't have any clinical features suggestive of lupus, it's meaningless. Uh, if it gets up to, you know, 1 to 640, 1 to 1280, I want to then look at their autoantibody profile. Do they have, and we'll talk about that in a minute, but, you know, what's their Rho and Law and SM and RNP antibodies, and are they abnormal or one of them abnormal? We also mentioned the rheumatoid factor in the CCP. Why? Because 80% of rheumatoids are positive, but not 100%. So 20% of patients are going to be seronegative. The uric acid level for gout is helpful, but again, uric acid levels can be all over the place. So meaning if you have a gouty attack, you can have a normal uric acid or you can have a raised uric acid. It doesn't mean a lot. The HLA-B27 is a good test for spondyloarthritic patients, but again, it only makes sense when the patient has symptoms. If you're just going to do it blindly, it's not of any help because one, uh, one in 20 North Americans are positive, and the majority of people who are B27 positive don't have any problems. So it's just the minority of patients who have it. So you have to be careful with that. 
And if it's appropriate, we do iron studies or PTH, as I mentioned just a minute ago. X-rays can be very helpful, but again, X-rays will only show you certain things. So you might see chondrocalcinosis in the knees, and that could help you make a diagnosis of pseudogout. You can see sacroiliitis, and I'll show you uh, some, some images, and you can see some erosions. Next slide, please. So this is just to show you sort of which labs you send. For the fluid, all you really need to do is get a culture. So gram stain is helpful, but a culture is really the gold standard because gram stains, even in the presence of bacterial infection, might be negative. But that's all you need. You don't need to do any chemistries on the fluid. You don't need to do complements. You don't need to do antibodies. They're of no help. Next slide. We can just go on. Yep. So this is just show, if we can just go back to those x-rays. So uh, this is a sacroiliac joint, so you can see the SI joints here, very narrowed. But this might take years, even decades, to show up. But when I see this, or when we, if that's in the protocol, you know this patient has sacroiliitis and they have a B27-related disorder. If you can go back one more, there's the knee, and then you can see that fine line. That's chondrocalcinosis. So if I have a patient who has a swollen knee, and that x-ray, chances are this is pseudogout because of the chondrocalcinosis. But some people can have that calcification, and it just doesn't bother them, but that's a damaged knee. If you have calcification of that degree, your knee is not going to be functioning. Even though it looks pretty good from afar, the calcification is not a good sign. Okay, let's, let's move on. So let's just try a few of these patient uh, scenarios. 24-year-old woman on oral contraceptives complains of bilateral wrist pain and limited range of motion for three weeks, having trouble making a fist, no sick contacts, uh, no eye redness. Let's go on. So let's look at the options here. It could be early RA, possibly. Next. It could be Sjogren's. She has some uh, difficulty making tears, so you think about that possibility. Next one could be viral, especially parvovirus. She's young and may be exposed to kids, making, has, has trouble making a fist. Drug-induced lupus, well, we don't know which drug, although the one drug I could think of, if she's taking an acne drug or oral, oral contraceptive usually doesn't cause drug-induced lupus, but certainly uh, doxycycline for acne can sometimes do that, so something to keep in mind. Okay, next case. 55-year-old woman with right knee pain for four months, had a tick bite, developed a rash, was given doxycycline. This is all appropriate. For four months, her right knee has been painful when she goes upstairs. Knee looks swollen. Doctor sent her for labs. Lyme titer was positive. She has a small joint effusion. And what else? What do you tell the patient you think this could be? So osteoarthritis, she's 55, and certainly knee pain in a 55-year-old is you know, always, always going to be in the differential. So it's a possibility. Next. Patellofemoral syndrome, which is another form of knee pain, usually when climbing stairs or descending them more than walking. It usually doesn't cause swelling, so I'd say it's less likely to happen, but it's a possibility. Next. And we could say not Lyme. You know, that, that depends. I, I wouldn't necessarily say I totally agree. If the Lyme test was positive, you could have Lyme disease. The problem is that... Uh, in Lyme disease, as I said, a lot of people walk around with a positive Lyme titer and you just don't know. And that's why we rely on the Western blot test, which usually is a more accurate descriptor. It tells you if the antibodies are IgM, meaning recently formed, or IgG, which are uh, formed late. Another point I'd make about Lyme disease is if your antibody is negative, you do not have Lyme disease. End of discussion. And then the other point I'd make is that all these late manifestations of Lyme disease uh, need to be you know, followed, if you will. By that, I mean patients often come in and say, can't I have Lyme disease when they're complaining of widespread achiness for two years? No. Patients who get exposed to a tick get a flu-like illness and get a mild achiness syndrome, kind of like the flu, and that goes away. When they get Lyme arthritis months or years later, it's one joint. When they get neurologic disease, it's months or years later. When they get uh, carditis or cardiac disease, it's months or years later. So it isn't like you get the tick bite and five minutes later, you're coming down with this illness. It's usually a long time after the fact. So that's something to keep in mind as well. Next slide. But all those patients with any manifestation of chronic Lyme have to be Lyme antibody positive. So again, if you're reviewing a protocol and somebody's asking, could it be Lyme? If their Lyme is negative, they don't have it. If their Lyme is positive, it's possible. It, again, it doesn't prove it. Then we have to go back and dissect carefully, are, are they positive, but that's not the cause of their problem, or is it really the, the, the case that it is? 
So here's a 59-year-old man with a second episode of acute elbow pain, denies trauma, drinks three beers, six months ago had swelling and redness over the entire right index finger, uh, and it has some flaky skin. So maybe he's got a skin issue causing this. Let's, let's look at the choices. So he had a arthritis, that flaky skin might be a patch of psoriasis. He's got elbow pain, certainly a possibility. Next. Gout, you know, guy drinks, elbow pain, certainly can have an electron on bursitis due to gout. We've seen that. Next, pseudogout is also a possibility, although I think less so being a male, but it's certainly, you know, in the realm of possibilities. Okay, next slide. So just to summarize then, you know, no pads or no ads, however you want to remember, look at the number of joints, look at the onset, look at the uh, activity effect, meaning, you know, better with sleep or not, distribution of joints and systemic or extra-articular symptoms. Next slide. Okay, any other slides left, or I think is that the last one? Um, that looks like it's it. Yeah, that's it, yeah. Okay, so I'm happy to uh, take questions. That's really my point. I think, you know, again, uh, what's important in reviewing these cases is dissecting out pretty early, is this an inflammatory problem, is this a mechanical problem, or is it something else like a pain problem? And and listening, you know, going through the protocol is very helpful, and then looking at some of the key labs is very helpful. So by the time, you know, by the time you finish doing that, you should have a fairly good sense as to, okay, which way are we going? And I think what happens in a lot of these cases is the doctors treating the patients are, you know, they're they're well-intentioned, but the patient comes in feeling desperate, and the doctor often feels that they have to be equally desperate and so they kind of jump around and do things that make uh, less sense or little sense. And by that I mean, you know, somebody who has something that's obviously non-inflammatory is suddenly given the label of an inflammatory form of arthritis. Once that happens, then all the heavy hitter drugs come in. You know, they're getting anti-TNF biologicals. They're getting all sorts of things that they may not have needed in the first place because of the misjudgment or mischaracterization of what their condition is. So that's why it's so important to to label these properly um it's uh, really I, I you know can't thank you enough uh, one for taking the pleasure. time to speak with all of us today but also for your your ongoing uh very active and and, and dependable and outstanding collaboration and uh look forward to uh, uh to much more of that great same here